بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ساری جنت رسول ازلی لکھا ہے ساری جنت میں رسول ازلی لکھا ہے ڈالی ڈالی پہ علی اور ولی لکھا ہے سب پتوں پہ حسن اور کلی پر زہرا سرخ و پھولوں پہ حسین بن علی لکھا ہے ساری جنت میں رسول ازلی لکھا ہے ڈالی ڈالی پہ علی اور ولی The first question that I've been asked to answer is, is fasting on the 9th and 10th of Muharram a sunnah of the Prophet? Why do we keep faqa? So those really are two questions. The first question is, is fasting on the 10th of uh, Muharram a sunnah of the Prophet? No, it is not. It is not a sunnah of the Prophet, indeed. The teaching is that we do not fast on the day of Ashura. Fasting in Islam is a, a symbol of joy. We fast when, when we are happy. Now, how do I explain that? Fasting is really a thanksgiving to Allah. It is thanking Allah for something. And we fast when we want to thank Him for some ni'mah. And hence you will find that the four most eminent days of fasting, what are called mumtaz, as uh, Sheikh Abbas Kummi describes in uh, Mafatih al-Jinan, he says there are four mumtaz days, most, most excellent days for fasting. And what are those four days? The first is 17th of Rabiul Awal. The day we thank Allah for sending us the Holy Prophet. The second day is Mi'raj. The day the Holy Prophet went to the heavens. The third is Dahwul Awr, the 25th of Dhul Qadah, when the earth, as it were, was spread. And the fourth is the day of Ghadir when Imam Ali alayhi salam succession was determined. So you can see they are all days of thanksgiving, all days of joy. We don't fast on the day of Eid because the fast, thank you very much, because the fast has to come to an, to an end. And to continue is to continue with the holy month when the holy month has ended. And so we do not fast on the, on the day of Eid. But otherwise, fasting on the day, any day prescribed for fasting, is a, a day of joy. Now, Banu Umayyah, la'natullahi alayhim, qati'atan, they were of course very happy, they were very pleased with, uh, the, the, with their murder of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And hence, they declared it a day of joy a day of celebration that they had succeeded in, uh, in, 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 uh, in murdering Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And hence they declared it as a day of, uh, a day of uh, joy. And as you know, they had companions of the Prophet who fought with them. We have seen how on the day of Ashura there were so many companions of the Prophet fighting on the side of Yazid. And they could easily be manipulated, the Sajirubillah, to, to say that they were, 
there were sunnas of the Prophet which did not exist at all. And a number of them have been, have been uh, shown patently to be absolutely false. And that the Holy Prophet never said what was alleged to have been said by him. This is one of that type of hadith in which they have said that the Holy Prophet has said that it is the sunnah to, fa to fast on the 10th of Ashura. It was not the sunnah of the Holy Prophet. Indeed, the sixth Imam, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi has actually condemned the fasting of, uh, on the day of Ashura and said it is wrong to do so. Now, Mufatih al jinan alhamdulillah, has been translated into Gujarati also. I am advised, I haven't seen it, but I'm advised that a copy is in the library of the mosque. And indeed, I'm advised that the Arabic and Persian versions are in the uh, library of the mosque. Anybody who wishes me to dig out that particular proposition, I can provide the page numbers in Mafatih al jinan in which this subject is fully discussed that one cannot fast on the 10th of uh, Muharram and it is not a sunnah of the Prophet. Well, the second subsidiary question is, why do we keep a faqa? Thank you. We, we do that because, because Imam Hussein alayhi salam and his companions were hungry and thirsty on that day. And Imam Hussein alayhi salam remained in that condition until Asr. At Asr he was, mart was martyred and hence his, his state of hunger and thirst came to an end at that time. We keep Farqa on the basis of the condition of the Imam alayhi salam and it is entirely, entirely out of, out of uh, uh, reverence to what he went through, entirely out of eagerness to act in the way he acted on that day that we keep a Farqa. It's not wajib to keep a Farqa, we do so entirely to be in the footsteps of the Imam alayhi salam and not eat or drink during the time when he did not eat or drink. I hope I have answered the question. Uh, if I haven't, please, uh, please point out to me and, and, and I can clarify what was not clear. But may I say one thing on, on my own behalf? I appreciate that in the hurry to answer questions or out of my limited knowledge, I may not say everything that is, that is uh, relevant in answer to any particular question. So if any of you wish to add to what I have said, or to contradict what I have said, please feel free to do so. Let this be an interaction rather than a one-way traffic. The next question is, uh, taking out processions of tazias, kissing tazias and, and alams is common practice, yes indeed. Kindly comment, is this shirk? No, of course not. It's not shirk at all. Uh, but I'm, I'm grateful that the questioner has put that question. It is, it is generally thought that kissing an alam or, or a tazia is shirk. Far from it. How is it shirk? Now, let's, let's go through it. Let us first get into the rationale of this alam, alam and, 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 and tazia. Um, the third thing mentioned is, yes, tazias, kissing tazias and alam. So we are dealing with two things. Now, insofar as Alam is concerned, what is it? It is the standard. The standard that the Imam alayhi salam had in Karbala. And we know that the Alamdar, that is the one who bears the standard, was Azat Abbas alayhi salam. Now, all that it means is that it is the flag that the Imam alayhi salam had in Karbala. It is no more than that. And when we take an Alam out, all we are doing is... We are, we, we are saying that just as the Imam alayhi salam had a replica, had a, had a, had a standard, had an alam in, in Karbala. And by the way, having an alam was quite a common practice. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he too had an alam. He, he had alam in Madur, he had in Ahad, he had in Khaybar, he had in Khandak all the time. And his main bearer of the alam was Imam Ali alayhi salam. So there is nothing new in this. And Umar ibn Sa'ad had his alam too. It is not a one-sided affair at all. When we discuss uh, uh, Hazrat uh, Mukhtar, we will see that he had his alam. And even the Tawabun had their alam. 
So it is quite common practice. There is nothing, nothing peculiar or special about there being an alam in, in Karbala. Right. And that is all that there is. It just is the, the flag. Because every side that, uh, that, uh, that, 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 uh, that, uh, that fights in, in a battle is supposed to have its, uh, its flag. Mandalibai, somebody from the rear wishes to give a question. Uh, however, now, why do we take out an alam then? Let's, let's get that sorted out, because that will answer the question. We take out alam saying to Imam Hussain alayhi salam as it were, that just as there was your alam. Now, one more thing. The purpose of an alam always is that those who are fighting for one side rally round or behind that alam. If, if I'm fighting in a battle and I suddenly am in the middle of the battleground, now I don't know which side is, is mine because there are soldiers fighting all over. I turn round and look at where the alam is and I go towards the alam. The alam is supposed to show me where I belong. And the moment you see the alam, you know that's the alam of this side and that's the alam of the opposite side. Now when we take out the alam, we are taking, telling Imam Hussain alayhi salam that if we were in Karbala, we would be with the alam that is yours. We would be behind your alam and we would be in that group which would be following your standard, your alam. This is the alam we have set up. We have set up as indicating your alam. It is not your alam, of course. It, 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 your alam existed 14 centuries ago. It's not there now. But we have made this, this alam for tonight to show that we regard this as your alam for tonight and we rally behind it and we rally around it to show to you that we belong to your army and not the army of your opponents. And that is all that it means. It is always very important to, to, to know what the purpose of any instrument is before that instrument can be, def to, can be concluded to be shirk or not. Now, just as the, 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 the idols that the Hindus use, to the extent that the Hindus turn around and say, Oh, but we don't regard this idol as God. So we say, well, then why do you worship before it? Why do you keep it before you and worship before it? And they say, oh, this is only a medium to God. But that is exactly what the idols were in the Kaaba, the 365. They also said, these are medium to God. And the Holy Prophet said, this is shirk. And broke them all down. So the important thing is to know what is the purpose of that, of that thing that we are talking about, that instrument that we are considering. Just as we gave the example of the idol. That is what the alam is. Now let us see how does shirk come into it. Shirk is associating something with Allah. That is shirk. Either as a partner or somehow associated with Allah. We are not saying that that alam is associated with Allah at all. We are not even saying that that alam truly is the alam of Imam Hussein on that day. All we are saying is that as we are out to show our loyalty to Imam Hussein alayhi salam tonight, we also have an alam and we rally around that alam saying that if we were in Karbala and if that, is the alam, that was the alam of Imam Hussein, we would rally around it. And that is all. Exactly the same is the question with Tazia. Tazia is supposed to be the replica of the Dari in Karbala. Tazia usually is the Zari of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Now, thank you very much. Now, the Zari of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, nobody can say is shirk. It's no more than a construction on the grave of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. So if it is a construction on the grave of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, that is something that you find on all graves around the world. And all we do is that we make that tazia saying to Imam Hussein alayhi salam as it were, that if we are not in Karbala tonight, because who, what Shia exists, who does not want to be in Karbala on the eve of Ashura or on the day of Ashura? But not everybody can be there. And hence those of us who are deprived of being in Karbala on the day of Ashura, turn round to the Imam alayhi salam and says, if we can't be there, we will make a replica of your zari. And we'll kiss it, telling you that if we were in Karbala, we would be kissing your true, true, true zari. 
This is your replica which we only kiss as, 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 as a, a, a substitute of your zari which we are not able to kiss. But it is not necessary to kiss it, it is not wajib to kiss it. It's what is in our heart. We have discussed this, the Imam alayhi salam taught. It's the piety of the heart that ultimately matters. But if, out of emotion, one feels, if that is the replica of the zari of the Imam, I will even kiss the replica. There is utterly nothing wrong in it. Because even that replica of uh, the zari of Imam Hussain alayhi salam has baraka in it. It has baraka because Allah is pleased to see that his martyr is, is revered. And if his grave is then uh, made into replicas, then that is also acceptable. Shirk is associating something with Allah. Neither Taziyas nor Alam in any way at all are associated with Allah. And hence, uh, I, I, I say there is no shirk there at all. Uh, can you comment on making... I can't, I can't read this. Can you comment on making? Mannats. Oh, mannats. And then? And then holding? Prayers. Oh, mannats. Thank you. Is this, is this akin? Is this akin? All right. But the same thing, akin or to a deal with God. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohsen. Well, mannat is easy. Because insofar as mannat is concerned, what is mannat? It's a vow that if Allah will be pleased with to, 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 to grant me, to grant, I'd like to say, shafa'ah to my sick children, I will keep a fast. Isn't that a mannat? I hope that's what the questioner has in mind, because that is what we usually understand as a mannat. Now, that is prescribed for in, uh, in Quran. وَيُوفُونَ بِالْأَحْدِ وَيَخَافُونَ يَوْمًا they, 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 they kept their vows and they were afraid of that day, the length of which is, is, is horrendous. And how did they keep their vow? وَيُتْعِمُونَ الطُعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا And then, they said to those miskin wa yatim wa nasir, Nut'imukum li wajhillah la nuridu minkum jaza'an wa la shukura. That is what, that is what the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam did. Hassanayn alayhi salam was sick and, and uh, the Holy Prophet, it says far as that, the Holy Prophet goes to Imam Ali alayhi salam and Bibi Fatima Zahra salamullahi alayhi and says, I see Hassanayn are still sick. And uh, Bibi says, yes, they are still sick. What, what solution do you suggest, uh, my dear father? And he says, keep a vow, make a mannat, make a nazr. And that's the word used in Quran, nazr. Make a nazr that if they get well, you will fast. Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam immediately made a nazr that if my two children will get well, I will fast for three days. And Imam Ali alayhi salam was there. He says, Fatima, if you make that nazar, so will I. If our two children will get well, I will also keep a fast for three days. So you can see, there is ample authority for keeping a nazar. The important thing is to fulfill it, not to leave that nazar then unfulfilled. Because Allah, when He talks of you foon another, that they fulfilled their nazar, immediately talks of their being afraid of that day day on which people will be questioned about their nazar. And, and indeed, the ayah goes on to say that they fulfilled their nazar, they kept the fast, and on that day, they even gave away their loaves. The, feel free to ask supplementary questions or to wish to add, if you wish to add to anything that I have said. Yes. I beg your pardon. Sorry, the, the purpose for which the nazar is kept, well, the purpose for which it is kept is, is, uh, is any lawful purpose. Any, any purpose which is lawful in Sharia. Of course, one can't keep a nazar that if I win a sweepstake, I will. 
as in one of your lectures you have defined the word Shia, can you explain it again? I think you had given reference of Imam and defined the word Shia. Yes, indeed. Well, I don't think I defined the word Shia, but I certainly mentioned the word Shia as the questioner says, and I certainly did say it came from the Imam. We were discussing sayings of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. The purpose of discussing those was that it should not be felt that sowing sayings only came from the Holy Prophet and uh, uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam. They are sayings of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, and books have been written on the sayings of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. I had reserved but one night for those things and did not complete uh, them all. Didn't com deal with all that I had uh, reserved for consideration. One of those things that I mentioned was that a person uh, goes to Imam Hussain alayhi salam and says, I am one of your shears. And Imam Hussain alayhi salam says, well, do not make a claim. Those are the words in that saying. Do not make a claim about which Allah may have to question you on the day of judgment. Khulu anamin mawalikum wa muhibbikum Say that I am from your friends and from your lovers. Now, Imam Jafar Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi He went clearer and said that, that our shares are people of whom we would be proud. So to be a Shia is, is a level at which a person lives fully as a Muslim is expected to, to live. I am not saying that he has got to be a masoom, but he certainly must be a person who does not sin openly. And if he sins at all, he, he sins inadvertently. He does not sin deliberately. And it is when one attains that level at which one does not sin deliberately at all, one can call himself a Shia of the 12 Imams, alayhi salam. But if one does not attain that level, and it is not an easy level to attain, but we all struggle all our lives to attain that level, then the better course is to call ourselves friends of Ahlul Bayt. We all know that Hazrat Imam Hussain alayhi salam could have easily destroyed the army of Yazid. So why didn't he do so? Well, Imam Hussain alayhi salam did not do so because uh, Imam Hussain alayhi salam, and I want to go a little, a little, I see there are a number of questions, so I don't want to take very long on these questions, but, and if I am too short, please, please put me right. Because the idea is we want satisfactory answers to every question. But on this question, I want to get just two steps behind so that it becomes easier for me to move on. Imam Hussain alayhi salam saw what happened to his father, Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam Ali alayhi salam became obliged to fight. And from the day he became Khalif, he was, he was uh, confronted with battles. His opponents set up battles for him one after another. Imam Ali alayhi salam did not go out to fight on his own accord because he never had the time. He never, there was so much to be put right after the first three Khalifs that he never had the time to go out to fight. But situations became such that he had to. It all started with, with Muawiyah. Muawiyah creating problems for him. Uh, Muawiyah saying that uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam was uh, guilty of uh, murdering Uthman, a blatant lie. And it is, uh, there is no proof of it till today. And nobody who is a responsible historian even makes that allegation against Imam Ali alayhi salam. All that is said is that Muawiyah said so. And obviously, very falsely. Because if anything, Imam Ali alayhi salam helped Uthman all along. <coughs> because Uthman asked for help. And Imam Ali alayhi salam's attitude was that if he could help, he would. Imam Ali alayhi salam was the person who went out and spoke to the Egyptian army not to, not to see, to, not, not, to, not to have a siege on the palace of Uthman. And Imam Ali alayhi salam was the person who went out and explained the people on the outskirts of Medina. These are matters we have already discussed. I'm only reminding you. We discussed those in 1999. 
However, he, he just wanted an excuse, Muawiyah. And he turned around and said, no, I don't recognize Ali as the Khalif, and started to create subversion in Kufa and in Medina. A stage was reached when Imam Ali salam had to threaten him and say, look, if you do not stop this, I will come and, and, and fight you. But Imam Ali salam did not even have the chance to do that. Because in the meantime, Aisha created her problem with, with Jamal. And Imam Ali salam had to leave Kufa and go to Basra and fight in, in, in Basra. Immediately that battle is over. And his, his Khilafah is established at least in the truly Islamic commonwealth of that time. Keeping aside Syria, the moment that is, it is done, the Kharajites cause him problems. And he has to come out and fight in Nahrawan. Once all that is taken care of, he had to go and, and, and confront uh, Muawiyah in Sifin. But the lesson learned from all those wars, that it did not cure the problem that Muawiyah was succeeding in creating all the time. It is Muawiyah who first generated this question of Uthman, which was picked up by Aisha. It was Muawiyah who, who, who created the problem of Kharajites. It was Muawiyah who created, created Sifin. But in Sifin, it became very clear that the people themselves, the people who had gone out to fight with Imam Ali alayhi salam, the people who were saying that Muawiyah was wrong were the people who turned around to Imam Ali alayhi salam and said, as Muawiyah is lifting Quran, you make settlement with it. Imam Ali alayhi salam said, look, I can't make a settlement with him because this man is a liar. You can't deal with a liar. There is only one way to keep with a liar and that's to ignore him, to keep away from him. Because one lie, he will manufacture so many more lies. They wouldn't understand. And I Imam Hussein alayhi salam saw how those who were supposed to be in the camp of Imam Ali alayhi salam, how they subverted and threatened a rebellion, a civil war. Worse than that, he saw that the Kharajites who were fighting with Imam Ali alayhi salam suddenly set up their own, fiction, uh, their own faction despite the fact that they had already been beaten off in Nahrawan. And yet they created this other faction. And ultimately the Kharajites even brought about the martyrdom of Imam Ali alayhi salam. That picture which Imam Hussein alayhi salam had became even stronger in the time of his brother Imam Hassan alayhi salam. When the whole group of Muslims, Shias, went out to fight with Imam Hassan alayhi salam. And yet they deserted him. They were bribed by Muawiyah. They accepted the bribes shamefully, disgracefully. They accepted the bribes. And commanders just eloped. The person who was supposed to lead Fajr prayers is not seen when, when Fajr Adhan is recited. And somebody else had to lead prayers because he had been bribed with some half a million dirhams. Now, Imam Hussein Islam was totally disgusted with that situation. Although Imam Ali alayhi salam won Jamal and he won Nahrawan and to all intents and purposes he won um, Sifin because Muawiyah was not able to, 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 do, to dethrone him. And although the settlement that, that Imam Hassan alayhi salam accepted offered by Muawiyah, even, even that settlement was fully in favor of Imam Hassan alayhi salam. And as I hope we discussed last year, it was really the victory of Imam Hassan alayhi salam. Friction did not stop. Muawiyah was still able to perpetuate, to perpetuate his, his wrongs, to, to, to convert Shias against the Imams alayhi salam by accepting bribes and disturbing the commonwealth as a whole. When the time came for Yazid to ask for bayah, Imam Hussein alayhi salam found himself in a state in which he was not able to trust the Kufians at all. He was not able to trust the Madanites at all. And we saw this in the 10 days. Imam Hussein alayhi salam also saw that whilst Imam Hassan alayhi salam could have fought by himself, 
just as Imam Hussein salam could. Imam Hassan salam decided that the interest of Islam, the preservation, the long-term interest of Islam, lay in making the settlement in which he did. Imam Hussein salam examining that situation of the commonwealth, came to the conclusion that the right thing for him to do was to offer a sacrifice. Because fighting Muawiyah and winning Muawiyah would not have eliminated the spirit of Muawiyah. There would still have been the people like those who fought Imam Ali in Jamal, like those who fought in Nahirwan, who would perpetuate the problems. And he would say, oh, Imam Hussein salam was not necessarily right. He was the more powerful of them. Like his father, and we shall see this accused, uh, uh, this accusation made against Imam Ali salam when we discuss Mukhtar. Like his father, he was a ferocious fighter. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, la'anatullah alayhi, described Imam Ali as, as, as a wizard in a, in a battlefield. So he was, he was a kind of a wizard who could play his, his, his tricks on a battlefield. But, but whatever they said, they said that kind of things for Imam Ali alayhi salam, because they were not sent, because they could not fight Ibn Abdawad, they could not fight uh, Marhab, but Imam Ali alayhi salam did. Now to protect their own position and to save their skin, they turned around and said he was a wizard. He was... They would have said exactly that of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And they would have said, oh, he was just a wizard. He managed to kill everybody because like his father, he was a ferocious fighter. And so was Abbas, again, the son of the same father Ali. And so was a Muslim because again, a cousin. This family is a family of ferocious fighters. They fought these people and, and, and they killed them. And they fought and killed in order to obtain the sultanate, in order to obtain the khilafah, in order to become the caliphs. Now, if that is what would have been the consequence of Karbala, the whole purpose of Karbala would have been defeated. The whole purpose of saving Islam would have been defeated. Because Islam then would not have been saved as it has been saved today. We would not have been Shias. We would not have been Shias because the entire color would have been changed by the historians prompted by Muawiyah and his cronies. But today... Alhamdulillah, and this is the grace of Allah on us, for which we must continuously thank Him. Today, there is no accusation that anybody can make against uh, Imam Hussein alayhi salam with regard to Karbala. The moment an accusation is made, it is seen that this is being made patently, maliciously. The accusation, for example, that he went to fight in order to become a khalif is ridiculed. It's ridiculed by non-Shias, by non-Muslims. One example I gave the other day was of Charles Dickens. Totally ridiculed because no sense can be given to that allegation at all. And hence, even the Sunnis today accept that he was the greatest of martyrs. Indeed, non-Muslims accept that he was the one of the he was the greatest martyr mankind has known. Now, that situation is is extremely important. Because the moment he is accepted as martyr, the next question that automatically arises is, what was he a martyr for? What was the principle involved? Because there is no martyrdom unless there is a principle beneath it. I mean, some people are called martyrs because they fought for the freedom of their country. Right, that's the principle. Fighting for freedom of that country. What was Imam Hussain alayhi salam fighting for? And there is only one answer that can arise. He was fighting for preservation of Islam. Oh, so if he was fighting for preservation of Islam, that naturally means that those who were opposing him were enemies of Islam. They wanted destruction of Islam. You see how, how Imam Hussein salam planned it beautifully. That these fellows who are not prepared to condemn Muawiyah are hypocrites. Because there is no way Muawiyah cannot be condemned for what he did. He went, he set out to kill the grandson of the Prophet because he wanted Islam destroyed. And there is no question about it when one comes to think that Yazid sits on the throne in Damascus and says, there never was a wahi and there never was a book. This is all a game played by Banu Hashim. One can see what they were up to. And more and more examples of those if uh, when we come to discuss Mukhtar. Well... 
Uh, we had five nights for Mukhtar. Uh, uh, we are lucky we have been able to get a sixth night. Uh, then I am also not available because I am leaving for uh, Gujarat, having committed myself to be there. So we will be cramped when we are discussing Mukhtar. But that is nothing new. We have always been cramped for time. In the, in the Ashra of Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, we were again cramped. And we could not discuss one subject altogether. But given the opportunity, given the time that we need to discuss Mukhtar, we will see a number of such examples of the type that I have cited. Of what, what people fighting in the army of Yazid said about Salah, what they said about Saum, what Ma'adullah they said about the Holy Prophet. And they repeated it when they were fighting Mukhtar. So Imam Hussein alayhi salam, by not fighting them and by giving the sacrifice he did, was able, was able to say, not only save Islam, but also destroy those who destroyed Islam. And we will see how they were physically destroyed, each one of them, starting with Yazid himself from tomorrow night, inshallah wa ta'ala, and all of them, Umar ibn Sa'ad and Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and Shimr and a lot of them, la'natullahi alayhim ajma'in. We, we will go through that process, inshallah. They were not only physically destroyed, but the fact that people rose meant that those who were quiet when Imam Hassan alayhi salam was frustrated by Shia, those who were quiet when Imam Ali alayhi salam was frustrated, and those who were silent to let Imam Hussein alayhi salam be martyred, began to realize that we are betraying truth. We are betraying justice. We are betraying the cause of Allah and came out in the open and fought. But tyranny was exposed as a result. The question I ask is, and I'm sorry to take long on this, but I thought it was an important question. Um, but I hope we, we shall deal with the questions that remain. The important question is, if Imam Hussein salam had not sacrificed, and it was just a battle and he had just one battle, what would history have said? What we are having tonight would not have occurred at all. And if Imam Hussain alayhi salam had not gone to Karbala to, to, to present the martyrdom as, as he did, and just remained in his house, or just said, well, I'll go away, I'll run away to India. Because one of the things he said, but we never had the time to discuss, although some people say it's not an authentic hadith, but some say it very much is. He even told, told the people in, on the day of Ashura in one of his speeches, that if you think... I will still cause problems if I'm here. I am prepared to go to India. And hence, India is fervent with Azadari saying, Oh Imam, if you truly had come here, we would have helped you. Nobody would have touched you. We Indians would have guarded you. Dare not Yazid or his cronies touch you at all if you were with, with us. So you see, all these, all these concepts arise because of that Shahada. If that martyrdom had not been there. I go a step further. I said this in, um, in, uh, in, in, uh, in um, Stanmore one day and uh, at, 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 a, at a function like this. I go a step further. It is so easy to say that Islam would not have been saved without martyrdom. I go a step further and say the name of Allah would not have been saved without martyrdom. I go for, what I mean to say is there would have been no Christianity today. But for the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, there would have been no Judaism without the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Where is Christianity today? Who is prepared to accept this question of Trinity? Those who, who ritualistically accept Christianity, accept Christianity. But Christianity was faltering. Christianity was already dimming its, 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 its light, as, as particularly after the, the coming of, uh, of the Holy Prophet. The, the leaks and false of Christianity were becoming apparent. It is the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salam that kept glowing that flame of, of Tawheed. Tawheed survives because of Imam Hussein alayhi salam's martyrdom. This thawab of, uh, of, of Jannah, if you sit and, and, and sit in a, in, in a majlis and cry over Imam Hussein, is not for nothing. That very principle, because Christianity today in particular, where well, you know this much that people are not prepared to go to the church, but the, the, the principle is, is waning altogether. It has no substratum behind it. And once that doctrine of Trinity goes, then the Father goes. 
with the Son. And the Holy Ghost goes with the Father. And the whole doctrine collapses. With Judaism, my Lord, alas, the position is still worse. And this is why I keep saying, we need to be very careful, we shares. We do not want to be like what Jews are. Jews today are of many types. But what is worrying me is, I'm not a Jew by any standard, may God forbid. But there is sympathy that the Jews should remain Jews because the name of Allah will be affected. Now they are saying, oh, I'm a Jew, but I'm an atheist Jew. Now, can you believe that? How can a person be an atheist Jew? And, and it is being said openly, shamelessly. You would, you would have found it on the front page of the Times. The Times, the leading newspaper in, in, in United Kingdom. It talked of that solicitor of, um, of um, the Princess of Wales, Lady Diana. The solicitor of, uh, of uh, Diana, Princess of Wales, declared, was questioned about his faith. And in, in, on the first page of the Times, this was reported, he called himself an atheist Jew. And when I asked them, how can you be a Jew if you're an atheist? Because a Jew has to believe in one Allah. Christians are further away from us on the doctrine of Tawheed. Hindus, Hindus much further away from us. But at least the Jews are nearer to us Muslims on the question of Tawheed. Jews believe there is one Allah and shirk is extremely important. They cannot allow any shirk with Allah, Jews. They will not allow any association of any kind with Allah. He is just one, la sharika la. Well, if that is Judaism, how can you be an atheist Jew? He says, oh no, but I am a Jew culturally. I am a Jew culturally, not, not religiously. Well, if you start separating things like that, we do not want that Shia who goes to Dongri, to Palagali, on Ashura night, only to see the alam, kiss the alam and go away. We do not want that Shia. We want that Shia who understands Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Hence these ten nights of discussions of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. We want that Shia who recites his salah and does not have to be reminded to recite his salah, does not have to be coxed to recite his, his, his salah. He says, it's time of salah and I do it. Imam Hussain alayhi salam said that to Abu Tamama when Abu Tamama on the, on the day of Ashura said, Mawla, isn't it time for prayer? And Mawla stops fighting, looks at the sky and says, Zakartuka salah. جَعَلَكَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ You thought of prayer? You mentioned prayer? May Allah ever count you amongst those who said their prayers? Shows what level Musalleen have. Shows what level those who say their prayers have. That is the Shia we want in, in the community. In other words, we want people in our community who follow the faith, who practice the faith. That is, the, that is the essential part. We do not, as I say, very important today. Because, unfortunately, America leads the way. And in America, these Jews are now spreading their wings. That you are culturally a Jew, but not, not religiously a Jew. And, alas, there are culturally Hindus in India who do not practice their religion. And you perhaps know more of them than I do. Now that is what we want to avoid. Imam Hussain salam managed to avoid that. And indeed, if this pattern continues, then there is nothing in Judaism to give it that spine. To give it that spine it needs still to stand erect. That spine comes from Imam Hussain salam. Because so long as Imam Hussain salam's name survives, Sunnism will survive. Leave alone Shiism. Sunnism will only survives because of the name of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Because if Imam Hussain alayhi salam's martyrdom did not exist, would the Sunnis have known Allah as they know them today? And if Sunnism exists and Islam exists because Sunnis unquestionably are the majority of the Muslims, and Islam survives, then Christianity will survive and Judaism will survive. So, so Imam Hussein alayhi salam's martyrdom is not confined to one firqa. That is why it is said 
that if man came to know truly what Imam Hussain alayhi salam, to har kom pukarengi hamara hai Hussain. Then every community will say, Hussain belongs to us. If only they came to know exactly what Imam Hussain alayhi salam truly was, it is the failure to understand him that leads to all these uh, all these difficulties. Uh, I. What better than salawat? It is said that if there is a prayer, like the prayer we had, talking of uh, Imam Hussain alayhi salam, recitation of salawat at the end of that prayer almost guarantees the acceptance of that prayer by Allah. Was Bibi Sharbanu alive at the time of Karbala? I don't know. I really don't know. There are conflicting ahadith on that point. You're talking of Bibi Sharbanu, there is conflict on whether Umm Layla was in Karbala. Now, we, we hear so much about Umm Layla being in Karbala, her conversations with Shahzad Ali Akbar on the night of, on the eve of Ashura, on the day of Ashura, <coughs> The hadith, for example, that when when he was fighting a, a giant of a, of a fighter, uh, and Imam Hussein alayhi salam becomes a little disturbed, Umm Layla says to Imam Hussein, why do you look disturbed? And Imam Hussein says, well, a big duel is going to take place now. Umm Layla, the mother's prayer is accepted. Pray that Akbar should succeed. And, and, and he did succeed. <coughs> There is no doubt that he succeeded. All the historians record that particular duel. As I said, alas, we don't have the time to discuss those duels. <coughs> but they are most interesting. And we will have that problem in Mukhtar also. Because there are very interesting duels that took place by eminent people. <coughs> Some of them we will inshallah make time and discuss because we cannot allow that to go unmentioned. However, <coughs> However, those controversies arise. Same with Bibi Sherbanu. I do not think I can answer that question with authenticity and certainty and say that she was in Karbala or whether she was alive at that time or not. Even <coughs> her grave in Tehran, there are two questions, two, two views on it as to whether the, the, that particular place where we are shown to be the grave of Bibi Sherbanu is authentic or not. When did she go to Shahar Rai? That's exactly what I just said. Even her grave in, in, in Rai, because that is part of Rai in, in, in Tehran. Whether it is authentic or not is open to question. There are two views about it. Uh, and so I really am not competent to answer that question. And it will not be easy. Uh, it will not be easy for my questioner to find an answer to that particular question. The next question is, what is the meaning of bid'ah? Bada is to start. Bidal ayn. It just means to start. And bid'ah is starting something. Now, that expression has a technical meaning with regard to, to, to religious matters. The meaning given is that if you start something which the Holy Prophet did not, then that is bid'ah. In other words, an innovation. The Holy Prophet did not do this. The Holy Prophet did not say his prayers folding his arms. So if you start that, that is bid'ah. Uh, we are told that uh, this weeping in, uh, in uh, uh, Zaw of Imam Hussain salam, is bid'ah. Because the Holy Prophet did not weep. Well, he did. And this is why I was at pains. This is why I was at pains to, to prove that he did weep. And he wept on various occasions for various purposes. But that is all that bid'ah means. Innovating, starting something which the religion did not prescribe. During... Uh, Oh, sorry, I think this is a question that has already been answered, right? During, during Mandi and Alam, and even in Imam Bargas, we see several people kissing halwa plates, sorry, and fruit plates. Please comment. Well, my comment is that I, I, I am surprised. Because as I said, we kiss the Alam saying to 
in, in our inner feeling that if truly this had been the alam of Imam Hussain, we would have kissed it and we would have rallied around it. This is a replica. We can't have, we were born so many years later, if Azadars turn this into, into um, thank you very much. If Azadar turn this into a standard for today, we will rally around it too and we will kiss it too. That is the purpose. But why a plate of fruits is kissed? Maybe the intention there is that if this is nadr in the name of the Imam alayhi salam, then it is holy food and I kiss it. But uh, it has no significance that is known in religion. Why aren't the names of Bar Imam mentioned in the Holy Quran? Who but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows? He knows what he wrote in the Quran and what he did not write. But for that matter, a number of things are not mentioned in the Quran. How many names of prophets are mentioned in the Quran? And these are these are these are prophets of Allah. But you will get how many? Twenty eight names, thirty names? Around that figure, out of 124,000, you only have about 30 names of the prophets mentioned. The question is, the question is, how is that important? How is that important? The holy prophet is the one who brought the Quran and the revelation. And knowing him and accepting his word is the most important thing. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran that the Holy Prophet does not say anything except on the command of Allah. That uh, you do not say anything. You do not say anything of your own passion or of your own will. You only say that which is revealed to you. And it is that Prophet who has given these 12 names. It is that very Prophet who again and again has given exactly these 12 names. The, the hadith you all know so well, and I will not take time on it, is of Jabir. That the Holy Prophet says, Jabir, you will meet my fifth successor, convey my salams to him. So those names have been mentioned again and again and again. And there are a number of things which have which are important, like the names of the prophets, which are not mentioned in Quran. The important thing is that uh, that uh, uh, the holy prophet has authentically mentioned these particular names. What is real concept of not saying salam on Ashura day? Uh, well, <coughs> the concept is this. That when we say salam to each other, we pray for peace for each other. But where is, where is peace on the day of Ashura? It's a day of mourning. It's a day of grief all the day through. And it is therefore not, not meet, it is not fair that when we meet another azadar, he is in azar, you, you offer him peace when we both are in, in a state of mourning. And hence the recommendation is, أَعْظَمَ اللَّهُ أُجُورَنَا وَأُجُورَكُمْ بِمُسَابِنَا بِالْحُسَيْنَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ May Allah enhance our, our, our reward, your reward and our reward, for, for, for the grief, أَعْظَمَ اللَّهُ أُجُورَنَا وَأُجُورَكُمْ for the grief that we are having on account of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. And may Allah include us. وَجَعَلَنَا وَإِيَّاكُمْ And may Allah include us and include you amongst those who will fight for, the, for avenging the blood of Imam Hussain alayhi salam with the 12th Imam alayhi salam when he will come to avenge the blood of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Well, not all of us manage to say the entire thing in, in, at length, but that is what is recommended to be said, that may Allah, instead of, instead of, because salam is really a dua. Assalamu alaikum is, is, is wishing him peace. And he wishes you peace. As a result, there is peace. But that, that prayer for peace is substituted by a prayer that because he is in grief, may Allah increase his reward. And he would say the same to you, may Allah increase your reward for the, for the grief of that particular day. 
and uh, till how many hours we can't say salam on Ashura day until the grief ends really until Asr. But we prolong it till Sham e Gariban as a matter of as a matter of courtesy. But 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 really it ends at Asr at the martyrdom of the Imam alayhi salam. And if said by mistake there is no guna oh no. No, there is no guna if said by mistake, indeed. There is no guna even if you say deliberately. But uh, but it's a matter of etiquette. It's a matter of ethics that that should not be done. My Lord, I've got a long question here. Ji? Is it possible to make a precy of this? Thank you very much. Oh, the next one is also so long. Well, I'll... I'll, I'll this one is not on my subject. No, this is correct. These are, I thought you were talking about these are many questions. Oh. The now, the tick means I deal with it. Yeah. This question has cropped into my mind after attending Majalis. Well, let's deal with it. That's important. Oh, at Mughal Masjid on Shabi Ashu. So, maybe it's not technically concerned with us. Sunnis say that Shias are themselves responsible for the shahadat of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Can there be anything more, more ridiculous than that? Although not directly, have they not by their conduct, partic particularly the Kufians, facilitated this? What can be a proper response to this argument? Well, how can the murderer accuse somebody else of facilitating the murder when he is wholly responsible for it? If that was a defense, every murderer would turn around and say, as I was murdering the other man, you were standing there, you didn't come to stop me, so you wrote for a murderer? It's a ridiculous argument. It's an argument that just can never be allowed to prevail. It's nonsense. It's totally nonsense. It, is, it just means that those who called Imam Hussein alayhi salam may have been guilty of not, of not keeping their word. They may have been guilty of khiana, of infringing that bayah, whatever, whatever charge you want to put against them. But they did not therefore facilitate the murder of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. They did not go and say that kill Imam Hussein alayhi salam or take part in it. Yes, those who actually went to Karbala to, to fight Imam Hussein alayhi salam, they killed him. And hence our, our lana on them all. Wa shaya'at wa bayat wa ta'bat ala qatlih. Allahumma lanhum jamia. Curse on all those who, who, who mounted horses to kill you, who wore their armors to fight you, those who, who, who armed themselves with even stones to fight you. And, and ziyarat a beautiful ziyarat that the Imam has taught us. In that ziyarat, the lanat is further extended. He says, Curse on those who killed you, unquestionably. Curse on those who oppressed you. And curse even on him who heard of your being martyred and was pleased with it. Curse even on him. So... Maybe those who were pleased with, 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 with the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, that he was killed would also be, be liable to be cursed. But there is no way that one can say that the Shias who did not go to, 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 to Karbala were themselves the killers. Indeed, by not going there, they refrained from killing. <coughs> and my answer to this question is that if I'm not saying instead of being at uh, Mughal Masjid, he had been here. No. Mughal Masjid, whoever was reciting in Mughal Masjid was any day a superior Zakir than I perhaps ever will be in my life. No question about that. Any Zakir who was reciting in, in, in Mumbai or anywhere in the world, I'm sure is a better Zakir than myself. And I'm not entitled to have anybody listening to me. So I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that perhaps in the absence of that questioner, we discussed those hadiths in which Imam Hussein alayhi salam told people, don't be here when I make my cry for, for help. For example, that hadith of uh, Ubaidullah bin Hur bin Jafi, 
at uh, at Qasr uh, uh, ibn Maqatil. It is at Qasr ibn Maqatil that the Imam Hussein alayhi salam sees this tent and he's asked whose tent is it? He's, he's told he, it's of Ubaidullah bin Hur bin Jafi. He says, I want to see him. Ubaidullah refuses to see Imam Hussein alayhi salam. When I made the point the other day that the Imams alayhi salam help us even when we don't seek help from him, this is one of them. That the that Ubaidullah refused to see Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Imam Hussein alayhi salam walked to him and said, I invite you. This is the hujjah of the Imam alayhi salam. That I in, he invites him towards Amr bil Ma'roof. I invite you to come and help me. And he says, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun ibn Rasulullah. That is why I left Kufa. Because I didn't want, didn't want you to enter Kufa and ask me to help you. And I should be in Kufa. I don't want to help you. Imam Hussein alayhi salam says, all right, if you do not want to help me, make sure you are not in Karbala to listen to my call. Hal minna sirin yansuruna. Is there anybody who will help us when we need help? Because if you hear that call and do not help me, you will also be punished along with those who were in Karbala to punish me. You will also be destroyed. So that is the situation how Imam Hussein alayhi salam demarcated people who were there and who were not there. Who were there and who were not there. But <coughs> there is ample authority to say that those who then came out to fight, to avenge the blood of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, even if they were not in Karbala, but repented for not being in Karbala, the subject that we will start discussing tomorrow night, they too have been acclaimed very highly by Masumin and in the ahadith that we shall start seeing from tomorrow. And so far as I am concerned, it is just nonsense to suggest that the Shias killed Imam Hussain alayhi salam. There is no validity for that argument at all. But if anybody wishes to add anything to what I am saying, or if the questioner is not satisfied with the answer and wishes to read a, to, to, to ask a supplementary question, please uh, feel free to do so. Taking rounds in masjid, mafil, or procession of alam is understandable. <coughs> Taking rounds in alam is understandable. What is the significance of moving with fruits, mandi, roti, and kebab? We kiss it. Why? Sorry, we have dealt with that. Now these are a number of questions here. How come after our various prayers, our various ziyarat, we recite is only of third, eighth, and twelfth imams? Any special reason for singling out these three imams only? Yes. <coughs> yes, there is. We don't do this in vain. We single them out, we single out Imam Hussein alayhi salam for the reason we've just discussed. But for him, we would not be Muslims. But there is an express hadith, there is a special hadith from the sixth Imam alayhi salam, Imam Jafar Sadiq salawatullahi wa salam alayhi In that hadith he expressly says, that we must send salams to Imam Hussain alayhi salam every day. In fact, he says, and it is in Mafatihul Jinan, he says, you must send salams ten times a day. But at least once minimum, we must send salam to Imam Hussain alayhi salam for our own good. We must send salam to Imam Hussain alayhi salam every day. So that is another reason why we do send salam to Imam Hussain alayhi salam every time. And we do so on grounds of logic. Would Salah be there if the Imam Hussain alayhi salam was not there? So isn't it only fair, isn't it only, only thanksgiving to him that when he has saved Salah for us and we have just recited that Salah, we should remember him and send Salam to him? And we send Salam to the 12th Imam alayhi salam because he is an Imam of the present time. So that is easy to, to, to understand. We do not want to live a single day without sending salam to the 12th Imam alayhi salam. So we are left with the 8th Imam alayhi salam. The 8th Imam alayhi salam, 
the reason usually given is that when he was stopped <coughs> on his way to to Khurasan at Naishapur and the historians and the muarikhin and the fuqaha etc stopped and said oh grandson of the holy prophet you have come to iran after such a long time give us one hadith that comes from your grandfather and the hadith he gave is called a hadith with silsilatu dhahab with with a chain of narrations which is golden golden chain of narrations because he said that this hadith that i am just going to give you was given to me was said to me by my father the 7th imam alayhi salam who was told by his father the 6th imam alayhi salam he named them all maybe it is a good idea to name them all for me too so that you recite salawat on them because what is greater than that and he was given by the 5th imam alayhi salam and by the 4th the 3rd the 2nd ultimately by the 1st <coughs> and he says that hadith was given to the first imam by the holy prophet and the holy prophet got it from jibril from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the hadith is kalimatu la ilaha illallah husni those words la ilaha illallah is my fault allah says it is my fault man dakhalahu fi husni amina min adabi whosoever has entered my fort is spared is 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 spared from my punishment so saying la ilaha illallah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says means you have entered my fort and you are in my fort no enemy no harm can come to you because now you are protected by my fort he said that <coughs> and the curtain went down then the curtain was lifted again and the eighth imam took his head out and said walakin but bi shartiha wa shurutiha and paused and then he came out and said wa ana min shurutiha i'm glad that there are those of you who understand arabic here so he said yes the statement la ilaha illallah is my fault and anybody who enters my fort is in the protection but that statement has is subject to bi shartiha with subject to one condition and wa shurutiha and a number of conditions and that condition is belief in the holy prophet saying la ilaha illallah is not enough because maybe a jain he does not but maybe he could say that i say so it is not enough the second part of it wa muhammadun rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa sallam is also a condition which needs to